thank you very much, Ambassador Kakar. That was a great introduction. Um, I really appreciate it, and it's great to be here today at the Peace Islands Institute. Uh, I'm going to be showing some, some slides, um, so we'll be getting that ready. And while we're, uh, while we're setting up here, I thought I'd start off with a, just a, a, a brief poll here. How many of you um, were here in New York last year during the, uh, the onslaught of Hurricane Sandy? Okay, that's a good, good chunk of you. And how many of you uh, felt that you were, you were personally prepared to deal with the onslaught of problems that the storm threw our way, ranging from uh, uh, lack of fuel, lack of power? Uh, did you feel prepared? Okay, a um, little bit less, and that's really what I'm going to be talking about today in terms of how can we get more prepared for these types of storms? Uh, what are the potential linkages between this and climate change? Is this a storm of uh, the century, or is it the storm of every 10 years, or possibly sooner than that? And um, what are the linkages between Hurricane Sandy and terms of public policy and how we can uh, better inform ourselves for these types of issues in the future? So uh, once again, I am Thomas Chandler, and this, I work at the National Center for Disaster Preparedness at Columbia University. I'm going to be a little bit hunched over here to uh, get toward the mic so you all can hear me. And uh, so for starters, I think Hurricane Sandy really, uh, we, a lot of us were unprepared for it. I, I was actually personally unprepared for the, uh, the size of the storm as it, as it came barreling through toward uh, the southern coast of New Jersey and Atlantic City. And you can see here that the range of the storm, it was a thousand miles long, um, really unprecedented for this, this area. It, it, there were warnings along the entire U.S. eastern seaboard, which was unprecedented. And um, the, it caused a three-foot blizzard in uh, um, West Virginia, uh, massive flooding in, in New York City, New Jersey, um, really startled a large number of people. And just to bring that home, if you look at the tracks, historical tracks of different hurricanes that uh, came through this region, uh, the 1938 uh, Long Island Express hurricane went straight up towards Long Island. Uh, hurricane Irene, again, straight up. Uh, another one in 1903, uh, straight up. But if you look at the path of Hurricane Sandy, it's really unusual, the track it took towards the west, because it combined with another um, cold system and just completely turned this direction, so very abnormal. Um, and a lot of scientists have said that this is really a 700-year event, or even um, uh, longer than that. But uh, that's where the questions regarding climate change, you know, to what extent is this uh, something that could be a little bit more frequent? So it knocked power out for 8 million people, caused a 32-foot wave recorded in New York Harbor, again unprecedented. And I mentioned before, those three feet of snow. Um, so linkages to climate change. Sea levels have risen one foot since 1900. That's a, a fact. Uh, there's a lot of research regarding the intensity of hurricanes. Not really much showing the frequency of hurricanes increasing. But the intensity, there's, there's uh, some suggestion there that linkages to climate change could make storms more intense. And also the insurance industry has really been leading the charge and doing a great deal of, of research. Uh, Munich Re, a uh, German insurance company, has done a great deal regarding um, climate change in North America and is suggesting that weather risks are changing faster in North America than anywhere else in the world. But wait, <laughs> there are some caveats. Uh, the recent IPC, uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report, has to an extent downplayed the original linkage between uh, hurricanes and cyclones and climate change. Um, and the historical record of hurricanes in the Atlantic is not that long. And there have been monstrous, monstrous hurricanes in the past, such as the Great Miami Hurricane of 1926. In today's US dollars, it would have been a, a 180 billion uh, storm, which is comparable to Hur Hurricane Sandy was about uh, maybe 60 billion. So um, there have been storms that have been much more serious. So what we know, um, one third of all Americans live in counties 
immediately bordering the oceans. So the rise of urbanization along coastal regions is really the major problem. Uh, sea level rise will continue throughout this century. There's a little picture there on the bottom of 2070 where the sea level will be, will be in that particular coastline. Um, <coughs> and so looking at issues of risk communication in New York City in terms of um, what happened, New York City residents expected strong winds, but not really the extent of flooding that had occurred during Hurricane Sandy. One third of residents um, that were, were impacted <coughs> by the flooding did not have flood insurance. And there was a lot of uncertainty about evacuation zones. Um, those who were in the really serious areas did not always understand the, the level of severity of, the, of what they were facing. And there, I think all around the tri-state area, there was an underestimation of the power failures and lack of fuel. So why didn't people evacuate? Um, we did a lot of focus groups in the, uh, the Far Rockaways. Uh, first of all, there was a lot of uh, lack of family or financial support networks. The New York City shelter system in some ways, there were concerns about safety, particularly families that had young children um, were concerned of uh, potential of safety issues of bringing, bringing a group into that environment and felt more comfortable just staying, staying put where they were. Fear of looting. Uh, this wasn't really a situation like the Lo Lower Ninth Ward um, in, in New Orleans where homes and, and businesses were completely obliterated. It was really uh, standing housing complexes where the uh, people's stuff was going to remain there. So there was concern of, uh, of people taking other people's things. Religious fatalism. Uh, a lot of people we asked would say it's in God's hands or um, Someone from my uh, religious organization told me that everything would be okay. Uh, an inability to leave. Uh, a major issue in, in the Far Rockaways and Coney Island, a lot of elderly residents living in, in uh, apartment complexes had really difficulty leaving, uh, especially if the power went out. So the takeaway is that in a country that's as decentralized as the United States, a lot of people are not going to uh, voluntarily evacuate. So we have to look at new ways and conduct new research in which there can be really more um, decentralized messages through religious organizations, through uh, community-based organizations. In Hurricane Sandy, there was a big uh, impact of the Occupy Sandy movement. New community groups and, and online social networks that can integrate to better prepare the, uh, the response for a storm of this magnitude. And also looking at other nations um, in terms of the school curriculum. A lot of nations have that really built in as a part of the, the structure of how students learn in school in K-12 and at the university. And that's not really something that currently exists in most schools in the United States. There's not a really that culture of preparedness in the curriculum. An example of that in Cuba, uh, category four hurricane struck uh, Hurricane Ivan and there were no casualties. Next year, 2005, Hurricane Katrina, there were 1,833 deaths. Uh, primarily because, um, although it was a much more impoverished society, there was that culture of preparedness and, and in some ways, a involuntary uh, <laughs> evacuation protocols. So really the takeaway message is that you are your own first responder. Uh, there's oftentimes a misperception in the United States that help is on the way, um, that people think the ambulance will be there in the first, um, say, three hours, 24 hours, and that's oftentimes not the case. For a, a large-scale emergency like Hurricane Sandy or even uh, a major blizzard or something, God forbid, a lot worse than that, uh, there's not going to be any help coming for maybe three days five days and you're essentially going to be on your own. Uh, that means you're going to need a supply of food and water in your house and um, there needs to be a lot of more research and community oriented programs to get the public ready and aware for that. So th there are a lot of resources available. There's uh, ready.gov, FEMA.gov and the organization that I work with, the National Center for Disaster Preparedness. We have one tool that called the Preparedness Wizard, 
which is modeled a little bit after TurboTax. <laughs> so uh, you enter some situation, information about your own family's uh, needs, and you input that into the system, and it provides you with some customized advice geared for things that your family would, uh, could possibly use. So these are just some screenshots from the program. So uh, you need to assure food and water for your family. And if, if you don't have that water available, there's ways to purify water through uh, using something like Clorox. So if water is clear, add eight drops of bleach per liter bottle. So there's a lot of directions here that are just really um, useful things that you can consider. Another one that tends to be in that gray area in terms of preparedness is schools. What happens if there's a major disaster and you have children, and the children are, are at school, and you're at work, and the children are going to be evacuated to go somewhere else. What do you do? Uh, a lot of people would say, I'm going to go get my kids and take them and go with me. And a lot of other people would say, OK, we'll, we'll let them go separately, and we'll meet up later. But there isn't really a, a clear determination in policies today in terms of how that's going to happen and how that's going to transpire. So there needs to be better coordination amongst families, local government, state, and federal in terms of how this is all going to work. So some other benefits with Hurricane Sandy, there was an unprecedented use of social media, which brought together formal organizations like the Red Cross and FEMA uh, with informal organizations like, like uh, the Occupy Sandy movement, who were really working together to much more of an extent for the first time that hadn't happened in previous storms. Um, this type of social networking really uh, began to occur during the uh, earthquake in Haiti, but it hadn't really taken off to the extent with new technologies until Hurricane Sandy. But it also brought forward the need for constant power for uh, people who had cell phones, mobile devices that needed to be charged. Uh, you can see the picture on the bottom there on the right is people using a generator to charge their phones and iPads. So there were a lot of um, just uh, haphazard efforts to, to do that, but we need to get prepared for the next disaster uh, to do this on a, a more coordinated scale. So a few other issues when we, uh, we think about this in terms of the workforce is how do we actually measure that we're prepared? Uh, when we look at FEMA and um, various other groups, there are a lot of different metrics we can use. One is capacity, which is how much stuff do you actually have? Uh, how much money is being funded toward the program? How many ambulances? How much equipment? That's the usual metric, but it's not always the most effective one because just because you have the stuff doesn't necessarily mean that you know how to use it. So then that gets into the, the second level, which is the competency, which is the individual's ability to, re to respond. So say something in New York City during Hurricane Sandy, the 311 system, the ability for someone to field calls and give uh, coherent advice. It re requires investment and training, and there need to be evaluations that show measurable improvement. And then you get into the issue of capability, of what happens when you have different groups who normally don't communicate with each other, who need to interact immediately to get things done, such as as I mentioned before, the Occupy Sandy with, in New York City. And lastly, there's issues of the ability and the willingness for people to even come to work during different types of disasters. What happens if uh, there are <coughs> geographic boundaries that pre um, prevent you from getting to work, like this guy on the, uh, the left who's in the canoe? Uh, to what extent are first responders and public health workers going to, going to do that to get to the office? And then there's the issue of, uh, say, elder care or uh, families with children. Who, um, who's going to take care of everyone if you need to work for a 24-hour shift? Um, there's a lot of uh, rethinking in terms of what the workforce is prepared and capable of doing that needs to, needs to be done in terms of these large storms and also other, other types of disasters. So in conclusion, um, one third of all Americans live in counties immediately bordering the oceans, and the sea level uh, continues to rise, and the impact of storms like Hurricane Sandy is going to continue. So we need to uh, build on the good work of a lot of these organizations and um, continue to 
do a, a lot of problem solving. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Chandler.